gardens. Now, I know there are some people who feel that we've had a bad summer so far, but if you're a gardener, I think it's been pretty good. We've had lots of sunshine, lots of rain, everything's still growing very lushly, and if we'd had a dry summer, things like this wedding day rose would be over by now. Look at it, still got another few days' life in it, but I bet you've never seen one before clambering over and through a quarter line, like in Liz Colonnette's garden here in Guernsey. Later on, I'll be finding out about the surprising ingredients in Liz's compost heap. This has been part of your... Your dead chicken. Dead rats. chickens? Liz. Anne-Marie is mastering the art of dry stone walling with Dillis in the Cotswolds. And Carol Klein is getting her hands dirty down in Devon. Liz Colonnette and her husband Rod live in a handsome old house with a large garden overlooking Vale Pond in Guernsey. When I was here a month ago, the delphiniums in their lakeside border and the oriental poppies closer to the house were looking at their best. Now those borders are going over, but other things have taken their place and the garden is still full of colour. Those roses have been and gone since I was last here. Yes, things changed. I had really hoped that these agapanthus would be out. I was hoping for you as well, Monty. So there'll be another fortnight yet, week or really? a fortnight. The white ones will. But the blue ones are more forward. And I've got one patch which is really? absolutely beautiful, oh, which like you'll love those. that. Yeah. Thanks. So these are fantastic. Do you like them? Now, why do you think those are out earlier? I don't know why, because they've all got the same position, haven't they? They're lovely. Now, when did you plant these? Well, I've never planted them just popped up. You see, I can grow those without any trouble in a pot, but I can't overwinter them. They'd never just no. pop up in my garden. No. And I like the way against the yellow of the evening primrose and the marguerites. Yeah, it's nice, it's isn't beautiful. it? Beautiful. Now, the truth is, however great all these are, what I really want to do is get inside your greenhouse. Because be I dine out of your greenhouse, you know. <laughs> the biggest greenhouse anyone's ever seen. Back in May, I helped Liz cover all 75 feet of her greenhouse with a lime wash to stop her plants becoming scorched. Although there is one plant that Liz's son Philip put in, which I would be quite happy to see burned alive. What are you doing growing a prickly pear by the door of your greenhouse? You're well, mad, you're... Well, not from choice, not from choice. It's Philip's first thing he ever grew and he's got attached to it. It's very aggressive, you know. You come in the door and there's these spikes waiting oh to God. get you. So how do you control it? Well, I give it a bash from time to time. Really? Can I see you whack it? Yeah, but do stand well back. OK, what do you use? Um, any old stick. But one there, that'll do, won't it? Each chunk of cactus is capable of producing a new plant just as nasty as its parent. The thorns pierce clothing and then break off once they're well dug into your flesh. Thankfully, these bits of cactus are destined for the bonfire. Well, that's them out of the way. Looks better, doesn't it? It would look much better gone. You feel better gone, that's for sure. <laughs> well, your basil looks good. Yes, I'm I gonna... can get at it, you can see it. Yes. I'm going to cut that tomorrow morning when it's nice and fresh. You must use it sort of within the hour of picking it. Do you reckon if I cut it to within two inches it would sprout again? Yeah. Give it a good soak and it will come back. You're going to make pesto out of that? I am. I'll give you our recipe. Oh, thanks, Monty. Most of these plants would have been burned to a frazzle if we hadn't put that lime wash on the roof. Have oh, your tomatoes, you show off. Hi. No. There you go. What type money are they? They're moneymaker. They're good disease resistant tomatoes. They'll crop until December, maybe. Really? Yeah, so yeah. they're December. Incredible. Yeah. And what have you got here? Melons. Two sorts really? of melons. Each of these will be a melon. Yep. Do you pollinate them with a brush? If I think of it. So how often do you think of it? Not often. <laughs> <laughs> you are a funny one. I know. And your peppers, twice the size of mine. Fantastic. Cheers. This blanket, is that to catch the peaches? Yes, Rodney's put those up for that. Yeah. So that's his contribution to yes, the garden? Yes, they're really oh, delicate. Oh, there's some in there. Oh, good. Go on, try. God, you know what they feel like? Just like a baby's head. Yeah, it is just like a baby's head. So how many of these have you had? About 50, I should think. You must have to feed it a lot. Well, it's all in the soil. It's my really? seaweed compost in the soil, plus a top-up of liquid seaweed. Right. Talking of which, it's just the right time to go and get some more off the beach. Did you aim for that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go for it, then. You. Come on. Can we eat these on the way? Yes. Do you know, I think this is a fantastic luxury to be able to push a wheelbarrow onto the beach and get your own seaweed. It is, isn't it? Now, what are we looking for? We're looking for some good seaweed. If I could choose, I would have all this. This is bladderwrack. Rot's a bit slower, a bit right. lighter. But in the summer, 
We have to rely more or less on sea lettuce altogether. See, this is squelchy stuff. So when does the bladder rack come up? Autumn. For the big gales. Big, big autumn gales, October. So you lie in bed and listen to the wind? Yes, and hope it's blowing west. And think, whoa, bladder rack! It's this morning. It's <laughs> yes, today, yeah. So how much do you collect? Well, the first year I collected 97 barrow loads. 97 barrow loads? That was before the bad back. That's probably the cause of the yeah. bad back. <laughs> Does everybody do this? Is this a Guernsey thing? It is a Guernsey thing, but not many people do it these days. You occasionally see people coming down with a car and sacks and filling up the boot. There's all sorts of stuff in here. There's shells, here, like the crab, crab shell shells. Crab shells. There's the sandhoppers. Which um, will make it limey, which the worms yeah. will love. Yeah. Well, I reckon that's enough for battling over. OK. Seaweed is rich in potash and trace elements. If you can't gather your own, you can always buy it in dried and powdered form. Here we go. You're oh, right. that's not bad, is it? And how many layers would a heap this size have? Between six and eight, I should think. Really? So it's yeah. a very significant part of your compost? It's a really important part of it. What else do you put on? Um, shredded paper from Rodney's office, kitchen waste, um, garden waste, you know, lawn cuttings, things like that. Any dead chickens or dead rats? chickens? I do, actually. We don't have many of them. And rats? Buried oh. underneath? Fine. Liz, you shouldn't do that, you know. Oh, why not? It'll all rot down. Well, partly because it attracts other rats. Well, it doesn't matter, does it, really? And partly, do you really want decomposing flesh feeding your vegetables and fruit? I'm not at all bothered, actually. Are you not? <laughs> no. no. And right. there are not many, Monty. If I get four or five bodies in a year, that's it. Do you turn this? No, I don't. Too heavy for me. The Centre for Alternative Technology have come up with latest research on composting, yeah. which pretty much exactly mirrors this. Big heap, not turned, yeah. lots of paper and straw. Funnily enough, they didn't mention rats or chickens, but there Funny we are. That. And you leave it for... How long do you leave it for? A year. Yeah. At least a year. If they I... were saying 18 months. Yeah, well, if I could leave it longer, if I didn't need it, yeah. and if it wasn't ready... Liz's garden benefits from the mild Guernsey climate with lots of sun and plenty of rain. All that plus seaweed compost. And it's not surprising that her borders continue to flourish throughout the summer. <laughs> Dillis Wilson lives in an old house with a garden full of stone in a small town in the Cotswolds. Over the past year, she's completely renovated the house and started work on the garden. Working entirely to her own design, she's divided the garden into four distinct sections. Last time Amory was here, the two of them put up an arbour which marks a division between one section and the next. In the meantime, there have been more developments. So, come and have a look. I must oh. admit, I haven't done it all myself. I can't believe how much stone has been shifted. And it's so much bigger. This is brilliant. So this is all going to be grass, isn't this it? This is all going to be grass. This is my next job. To, to grass it all up, but it's, it's a hot day to be doing it today, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Do you fancy doing some stone walling instead? Yeah, I'd love to learn right. how to do that. First of all, we have to demolish one. Oh right. <laughs> so it's even well, better. The I like bit. demolishing stuff. Which right, wall? right down here at the front. Yeah. Well, can you see a bit of a difference between the two walls? Yes. Guess which one I started with. <laughs> <laughs> that one. This was Dillis's first attempt at a dry stone wall, and it's bulging out in all the wrong places. What I want to do is pull this down and redo it and make it more like this wall. So how are we going to start? Well, the first thing we need to do is pull the wall down. Bit of aggression. Mm. I'm going to wimp out and I'm going to wear gloves. Right. Because uh, this stone doesn't have to take it out of your hands. I'm going to give it a go and see how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing we need to do is put the stone to different piles. And basically, all these top stones we ought to put back over here because these are nice big flat stones. Right. Which are good for topping the whole for the thing top. off. Yeah. Yep. So they need to be put over to one side. And if we, okay. if we pretty much put them back in the way they are laid, yep. hopefully they'll fit back together again. That's the theory, anyway. With the precious top stones put safely to one side, we can start taking the wall down. So, have you always been into buildings like this? Uh, yeah, I suppose I have, really. I mean, I suppose it's an extension of renovating houses. You don't look like a tomboy. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I go sailing as well, and that's not where any girls do that either. 
I got a bit more girly when I started fencing boys at school. But as I didn't well, fence... that's precisely the time where I got a bit more girly. <laughs> To recreate the traditional Cotswold style, Dilly shows me how to select the stones according to size and flatness. This is a good stone, Anne-Marie, to keep. You see, it's nice and uniform and thick, and yeah. it's quite flat as well, so it'd be easy quite to like work that. with. Yeah, what's a bad yeah. one, then? Right, a bad one. I think I can see one. This one, this is a real baddie. I don't know if I can get this out without a lot of falling down. This is a really... That's a horrible oh, that's one. Ho that's horrible. See, it's stone, you're bad. <laughs> it's all uneven, it's not got a flat front. Chuck it. Oh, that's dead. If you just sweep it all along. OK. So we just now that we're this. down to the first two courses, we need to brush the soil from the foundation stones before we can start rebuilding our new and improved wall. When you pick your stone up, you plonk it in place, you don't fiddle around faffing looking for the right stone, and then you just keep twisting it and turning it, and it until it fits right. You don't put the stone back, you just... It's going to place. You pick it in your hand, you're going to put it in its place, and you just turn it around until it fits. That's good. So, like that, that's perfect. Start with bigger stones at the bottom, work your way up to thinner stones as you get further up the top. So do we need to backfill as we go, then? Yep, that's the best way to do it, and then really push it down behind the stones so that they, they're really firm. Okay. And if you have small stones or something, that's quite a good idea to put behind the immediate back of the wall because it just allows drainage to come through as well. We could actually be putting plants in now, couldn't we? Yeah. If it needs packing, that's where we put our plants, don't you think? Yeah. And it'll look entirely random. Yeah. Dillis has bought a selection of alpines, the kind of plants which grow in thousands of suburban rockeries. But here we're going to put them into pockets in the wall to create a living garden feature. Yeah. They're Mediterranean-loving plants, aren't they, really? So they want it dry and quite poor. They grow in the alpine regions, so they're torrid plants. They'll be actually. perfect for here because, actually, the Cotswolds is quite hot in the summer and cold in the winter. And, and that it's... is perfect, isn't it? Yeah, you've got it. It really is a really good place. And that would save it? me having to find a little stone to put in there to yes. stop all the earth running out. I think we should go for this one, do you? Oh, the sedum, yeah. Oh, I really like it. I think it's just got great red stems, it's hasn't lovely. it? Why don't we...? Oh, yeah. Be a little bit I like that stingy. Bit. Two for the price of one. Right, We're using a mixture of compost and grit, yeah. as these plants need good drainage to prevent them from rotting. If we put that with a cut down... Yeah. That's nice. Yep. That's OK. And squidge it right down. Oh, doesn't that look good? We I got, like doing this. You know we've got another planting pocket here. Can Why don't you put one in? Yeah. But do you realise that you've planted the first proper plant in this garden probably for 40 years? Oh, that's not fair. You should have no. done that. That, I'll have me a plaque there. <laughs> do you think we can split this one up as well? It's I don't know bit, if I would, you know. It's a bit fat and squishy. I want to pull some of that off. Here it goes. Oh, yeah. That'll be good in there. OK, well, let's get cracking. like the clappers. Our final job is to retrieve and replace our top stones. It's kind of ironic that we save the big, heavy stones to <laughs> the last, isn't it? Well, if you make them fairly flat, like a seat, then A, it looks nice, and B, if you have a party or anything... Then you can use them as a seat. Bingo! Oh, wow. doesn't that look better than it did before? We've now got a neat vertical wall in place of the bulging slope, with the alpines to complete the finished effect. Loads God, that, better! It's so tempting not to redo something. The thought of pulling a job down that you've already done, but I really think it was worth it, don't you? Yeah, not bad for a day's work. We'll take a break now, and when we come back, Carol Klein is going to be in Devon. See you in a moment. Welcome back. Now, if you've got a clump of flag irises and they're well established, now's the perfect time to lift them and divide them. You want to dig up the whole plant and then cut off the edges. 
because that's where the future energy is going to be. Let's get that up there. You can see the whole thing has coalesced into a lump. And if we, see that's coming off of its own accord. And we've got quite a few pieces there. And as long as you've got an inch or two of rhizome on each section, they're going to replant really well. And the idea is it'll get new vigour, it'll grow into a new clump, and then you'll do the job again in about three years' time. Plant them very shallowly. I like baked, sunny conditions. Just get them in the ground, nice vigorous roots on there, and then cut off the top of the leaves because there's nothing to support them. And if that gets windy, they're just going to blow over. That now will grow well. Divide the whole of the rest up, spread it around the garden, fill those holes up, and you'll have lots more viruses next year. Now, down in Devon, Carol Klein is visiting Chris and Bill Skills, where they're still working on that log garden. Chris and Bill Skills moved to Devon to live the good life. Their one-acre garden surrounds their cottage, and there's plenty of work that needs to be done. Theirs is a perfect garden partnership. Chris is the planner, dreaming up the ideal garden and nurturing hundreds of plants from seeds and cuttings ready to fill it. Fortunately, Bill can do the work as fast as she can come up with ideas. Without my action man, there's no way that I could do this, you know. I get all the credit. In fact, I think I get a lot more credit than I deserve. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a two-way thing, and Bill does an awful lot of hard work here. Carol Klein has been helping the couple as the garden takes shape. Together, the three of them have made a shingle garden, and on Carol's last visit, they made a start on planting up the pond. Since then, the pond has been topped up with water and Bill has started to turf around the edges. Oh, my. Look at that! It really works! Look at all that planting! And there are already creatures and all sorts of things all over it. Well, it's coming to life now. It looks as though it's been here for a long, long time. And um, what are these two? Well, this is something that has been somewhere for a long time. <laughs> It's sludge. Right. This has been at the bottom of our friend's pond, hasn't it? That's right. And it's going in our pond. Right. Because it'll be full of all sorts of insects, eggs and larvae and all kinds of things. Get your pond off to a flying start. That's right. And anyway, any excuse to get your hands in the... Smells good. ..bucket and mud. I might let Bill get mucky then. Oh, right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and me. Shall we have one each, Bill? <laughs> right. Isn't it lovely? I knew you'd like that job. <laughs> Oh, it stinks. Terribly good for your skin, you know. I'll take your word for it. Oh, you hands look so <laughs> much smoother. <laughs> no, that's the last thing for the pond, really, isn't it? That's right. But uh, I presume this is our next job. This is your bog garden, yeah? That's right, yeah. You've been busy again. I'm busy all the time. I think, actually, she's built a growth room to bury me, so there's no more jobs. <laughs> And you've already got all your plants together over here, Chris. Well, I've just put them all over there and I thought we could rummage through and see which ones sit properly in the garden, really. Yeah, the fine collection. You've also got some of your carnivorous plants, haven't you? They're beautiful. Are you just going to mix them up with your other plants? Well, no, because actually they need a different soil base because they need to have, like, a lime-free acid one. Yeah. And the others, the others, that's not important for. No. They just go in right. ordinary ground. So how about making a separate little bed and... I know. We well, are so good hole. at it. <laughs> it took me all day digging <laughs> that one. <laughs> so if Chris and I puncture this um, lining so that the... Puncture it? Bang goes my 25-year guarantee on the liner. Quite so, yeah. What should we use, Chris? Some forks? Forks? What do you think? The idea behind a bog garden is to provide a home for plants which grow naturally in the damp soil close to water. Although the bog garden must stay moist, water needs to be able to percolate through the liner and into the ground beneath. The carnivorous plants will be happy in this separate shallow bed next to the main bog garden. A layer of gravel ensures that the holes won't get clogged with soil. Before we fill the bed, it's important to remove any traces of weed. Chris and Bill's clay soil is ideal for a bog garden, as it retains water very effectively. The carnivorous plants like to have their roots permanently in water, so their liner doesn't need any holes. They're planted in moss peat, which is acidic and low in nutrients, just like the wetlands where they grow naturally. 
The peat's very light and dry and needs a thorough soaking before planting. I don't know anything about these plants at all. Well, they're a little bit different to your normal plant. I always thought they were really tropical and difficult. Well, they look it because they look so fancy, don't they? But in fact, that's one of the reasons why we decided to really go for them, because they're that bit different and they are hardy. So they'll withstand some frost. I've never planted a pitcher plant before, have Chris. Have you not? No, I haven't. They don't have many roots, do they? But I don't suppose they need them. They don't have roots because they don't need to get nutrients from the soil because the flies are their nutrients. Yeah. What it is, is that the fly comes along and there's, I, I don't know the technical name, but there's some stuff around the edge of the leaf and the fly starts drinking this stuff and becomes yeah. intoxicated and then falls down the trumpet. Right. And then as it decays, that's full of dead flies and that's how it gets its nutrients. Delightful. It is, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is, really. I bought some for the house, they're marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> and they're strange plants, really, aren't they? They are a bit strange, but then that's Bill. Bill like these. <laughs> <laughs> what, Bill's strange? <laughs> well, have you not noticed? No. <laughs> Very nicely strange. <laughs> but he likes unusual things. He yeah. likes unusual plants. Plants that I wouldn't go for. I like the colours, yeah. but he liked the shape and the whole like weirdness of them. And uh, I just thought they'd look smashing with the bog plants that we've got. That was simple, wasn't it? Mm. Shall we have a go at the big bog? That's ah. Bill's bog. Oh, Bill's bog. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful, Chris. They look so healthy and happy. Yeah. Well, I've made some of these by division, so there's lots of them. Yeah. Ah. So we can plant to our heart's content. I love this yeah. Ligularia. Yeah. This is Desdemona, isn't it? And I've got its relation. Right. The rocket? I think so. Where are you going to bring him? I'm yeah. going to put this ligula area here, I think, because it's going to go where the sunshine is. These imposing waterside plants originate from Asia, but are popular bog garden choices here. Desdemona has golden flowers in late summer. You're going to have all of these together. Yeah. I think you'll be taking them out in a year's time. I have to make another bed then, You'll won't have I? to extend your boggy area. <laughs> Bill will be thrilled. Yeah. What about these? All these plants will soon start to spread and need more space. But for now, Chris wants to pack the bed full for maximum impact. Oh, what about your prize specimen? Yeah, the Hermocallias. Yeah. All right. Daylilies are often used as border plants, but they really benefit from the moist conditions of a bog garden. This euphorbia palustris should do really well here. Palustris means sort of living in a swamp, living in a marsh. Oh, right. Good place for it to be, yeah, then. Yeah, ideal. Next spring, it'll give you these enormous, bright, limey green bracts and loads of stems. That's what I've been waiting for. Because I'll tell you what, Chris, everything in here is going to grow furiously. Oh, look, are you going to give us a hand? Bill doesn't know it yet, but he's going to have a lot more work to do before this bog garden's finished. I know you thought you were going to have grass all over there, but I think Chris has got designs on it and making a bigger and better bog garden. <laughs> well, that's all we've got time for this week. We'll be back the same time next Sunday night. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.